Hello, everybody. Welcome back for another video. Hope you're all doing well and that you're all having an absolutely fantastic day. And without any further ado, uh, let's jump right into it. If you've been paying attention to any of the news over the course of the last, I want to say, week, you, you you might have noticed that optimism has risen even further to new heights than we previously saw before. Everyone is of the same general mindset as to where the market is going to go with slight, sometimes dramatic deviations as to exactly how good it is going to be. It says a slurry of catalysts and historical behavior could catapult Bitcoin to as high as 160,000 US dollars in a widely expected bull market that analysts say could be underway in 2024. Those analysts are already slightly wrong and incorrect because the bull run has been going on over the course of this year. Bitcoin has once again, for those of you who missed it, already doubled in price and is near tripling in price. We have a lot of people who are expecting now time frame wise, I don't really know, but a lot of people are expecting Bitcoin to hit pass by $50,000 by the end of this year, just based upon speculation of what could potentially be happening in literally the next three weeks. That is a very hard time frame. That is like, you know, you know written in stone. In three weeks or less, something spectacular is supposed to be happening. And therefore, the prices would move even higher. Therefore, over the 50,000, we also heard before and have been hearing for a while now, a lot of people are expecting Bitcoin to uh, hit a brand new all-time high by like January or February. Now, once again, grain of salt because no one knows what's going to happen. It's more based on expectations. The, dare I say, issue is uh, if Bitcoin does hit a brand new all-time high before the halving even happens, we are probably, and these these numbers, the, the $160,000 is going to look like absolutely nothing compared to how high that we're going to go. And that's, you know, that's an if on top of an if on top of an if. However, this is being quoted as $160,000 US dollars. Expected demand for Bitcoin from several spot exchange traded funds in the United States, the upcoming halving, and growth in broader stock markets on the back of rate cuts could buoy Bitcoin's price to at least 50000 in the short term. I think maybe a lot of people have missed. I'm not sure. I'm going to try and give you the whole skinny. Do people still say that? I'm going to give you the skinny, the down low. I'm going to give you the information. Anyway, the point is um, the news that we've been getting, the speculations, is that apparently multiple spot Bitcoin ETFs are going to be approved. That was the rumor we had before. But like a video or two ago, for those of you who missed it, shame on you. Um, we saw that basically like five or six different companies now have their, I mean, their literal Bitcoin ETF names and their ticker symbols listed on the DTCC's website, which is historically seen as the final step before the actual, not not approval, but like it's kind of been pre-approved and now it's listed there so that the world can see the ticker symbol. But it's more so that like we also saw one of the companies has like a commercial for their Bitcoin ETF before the SEC has even said anything. So it kind of, you wouldn't make a commercial about you having a Bitcoin ETF for the public unless you already ha had one. The idea is then also that we would be getting between like 7, 11, not the store, but like ETFs at the exact same time, which is also causing a lot of people to be really excited. The having in itself is, ex if we, if we, and this is something that I think a lot of people aren't talking about enough, 
If we had zero expectations right now, zero, on the ground for a Bitcoin ETF approval of any sort, we would probably, just based off of logic and previous movements, probably get to around a $140,000, $150,000 Bitcoin by the end of the bull run. Why do I say that? Because historically, we've seen Bitcoin jump up in multiples compared to its previous all-time high. I think it is relatively, and I'm going like hyper-conservative here, hyper-conservative in numbers. It is logical to assume that if Bitcoin's previous, previous all-time high was $20,000, and then it went to $70,000 on the backs of the world being in literal fear as to, you you remember, and also like where markets are going to go. Are they going to crash? Don't forget 2021, the entire discussion was, are we going into a recession? Will we have a depression? How big will the depression be? You rem- this was This was daily in the news. We kept on hearing the stock market's going to crash. Everyone was terrified. Bitcoin, by all logic, should have actually gone over $100,000 with generalized ease over the course of the last bull run, but the, the, we, we, we were gripped by terror and fear for more or less two and a half, give or take, or so years. Going off of that logic of like even just a two or three X movement from Bitcoin's previous, previous high, not not even stating the it went from a thousand to twenty thousand, and then from twenty thousand to seventy thousand during this unprecedented black swan crow falcon kind of event. People always throw birds' names inside there. That's something completely different. If Bitcoin just and nothing else, based off of baseline demand from me, you, and your friends, and your family members, and other people who are getting into the market, Bitcoin, based on the halving alone, would double. That gets us to $140,000, $150,000. Now, add in the catalyst of markets are moving higher, and they're expected to go higher because of the interest rates remaining stable, And also the indication that we got maybe a week ago of interest rates being cut three times over the course of next year. It's expected a half of a percent every single time and or a quarter of a percent. The the, the idea being is that other countries have already turned the money printer back on and the U.S. is indicating that they're going to do the same. They're going to cut interest rates to improve the economy. The improvement in the economy means more people are making money, more money goes into the markets, you know the entire flow of how that goes. So when people, I've, this, is, this is a personal viewpoint, vantage point, from having seen people making price predictions, and I've seen a lot of people as well on Twitter uh, discussing it. Once again, I, uh, I, I float. I, I look at what people are talking about and what they discuss, and I, I don't always want to interject and be like, you're wrong. I want to see what other ideas people have. I've seen a lot of people um, from this channel, comment section, or also on Twitter, saying that they think that we're going to peak at around $150,000. And I've questioned many times why people have that idea. It could be just broader pessimism because of the previous cycle. If people just got into the market last cycle and they saw that Bitcoin didn't do another 20x in price, they may then believe or have the mindset, well, Bitcoin's only capable of maybe doing a 3x every single time comparative to what they saw before. This would still put us at a $210,000 Bitcoin. That's just based off of the halving. Remember last time the, the prices moved up because of the inflection of money flowing into the market and also because of the halving effect that we continuously see every single time. There's also, of course, the hype aspect. Everyone's making money. Everybody wants to make more money. More money flows into the market. The market goes higher. It's the cycle that continues until we get to that actual little point of the prices going back down. This is very different in, 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 in a multitude of ways. This isn't a oh, prices are going to go up based off of people just like, you know, buying Bitcoin because they like the sound of the word Bitcoin. 
we have now entered into a an entirely different realm of of money and i always implore you as always to do research and to and, and i mean if if you can as well find out like i don't want to say the term why money's so powerful that's very that's a weird sentence it's more of a you have no idea the money that's going to enter this market or that will be able to enter this market. A lot of times people have a very streamlined view of things. That's fine. We all, you know, we all do that. Um, as far as like when you're looking at something, but you you miss the was it the, the forest for the trees. We forget that there's not a lot of Bitcoin out there. For those of you who missed the video about two or three weeks ago, one of the estimates was is that there's maybe a million Bitcoin actually left for people to consume. These numbers come from the the wallets of major cryptocurrency exchanges, and people have said, okay, cumulatively, they have a million Bitcoin, therefore, there's a million Bitcoin up for grabs. That's also incorrect, because how many of you have your coins, whatever the coins might be, on a crypto exchange, but you have no intent of selling? You're simply housing them there as a way for you. You know, I, I want a more secure place than under my bed to hold these coins. Does that then equate to 50 or 60 percent of people have no intention of selling? Does that then mean that there's only 400,000 Bitcoin that's actually left? And like, like these are real numbers. This isn't me throwing it out there. If you've been paying attention to the videos here or my other channel, Money Rules, like we go over them, I give you the articles in the description below so you see exactly what I'm talking about. And it's not simply me like, oh yeah, there's one Bitcoin left. Over the years when I keep making videos saying there's not a lot of Bitcoin left, that's not because you know I like the title. No, there, there literally is not a lot left. We know like the numbers, we know the 85%, we know the 93% for those of you who missed that. Um, every wallet that holds more than one Bitcoin, they, they now are holding 93% of all Bitcoin. That's a 93% of all Bitcoin. We've already mined through, I believe, 92 or 93% of all the Bitcoin that's ever going to be out there. And it's held by, dare I say, the 1%, because less than less than... 1% of human beings will ever be able to actually have an entire Bitcoin, nonetheless 10 Bitcoins, 15 Bitcoin, 15,000 Bitcoin. It's in the hands of the very, very wealthy. There's literally not a lot left. We've even seen that these, these accounts or people who have been accumulating Satoshis over the years, they have not sold. They're buying and accumulating in anticipation of the potential day in the future where Bitcoin could reach half a million dollars, a million dollars, $10 million, $100 million. It's a lot of these things that people, when they look at the market, they go, well, Bitcoin did X last time. Well, clearly it's going to do the exact same thing again. You're missing out on the normal people, the normal people who've been like, breaking their backs to make as much money as possible to accumulate half a Bitcoin, to acquire an entire Bitcoin, people who accumulated Bitcoin before, people who are still accumulating Bitcoin now, the companies who are buying up hundreds and thousands of Bitcoin on a weekly basis that we then hear about, prices move up and it's like they were buying in secret behind the scenes until they wanted to say something public. You're missing out on the other hundreds of thousands of people who are getting into the market every single week. Like we know these numbers to be true. We see the actual new Bitcoin accounts being created all the time. People aren't accounting for the people who are, you know, on a weekly basis or a bi-weekly basis buying up a million Satoshis. You, 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 you have 100,000 people who are doing that. That adds up to a lot. You're not accounting for the Fidelities. You're not accounting for the Black Rocks. You're not accounting for the people who are in New York City, who are in Dubai, who are in Miami, who are in Paris, who are in London, who are waking up buying more today or have a friend who told them yesterday, dude, just put 30K into it. It's cool. I told you before, I've been to these conferences and these people walk around with immense amounts of money and they're looking for how much they should throw into the market. Like it seems odd and or like you know how like a lot of times you'll see like youtube videos like what i would do with a hundred dollars in the stock market and stuff like that there are people who have like disposable income like in hundreds of thousands of dollars and they don't know what to do with it when bitcoin's price moves up higher these people flood into new markets because they see like another money making opportunity 
everyone's not paying attention to all of those people. Now let's let's widen it a lot more. Let's say that there are a lot of people who have never really felt comfortable with the word Coinbase. They don't care for it. It, it sounds like something that they would not get near. The idea of a kraken, I, I don't like the ocean. I don't like I don't like squids. They hear that a, a Bitcoin ETF has launched with a company who they've been using for 10 to 15 years, who they get their insurance from, who they get their so you know they've they've traded stocks with them or bonds before. They see that the Bitcoin ticker symbol has popped up. They read through it. This gives you exposure to Bitcoin with as little as ten dollars. Throw your money into it. You know, I have an extra five hundred. I'll throw my money into it. This is not including the institutions who've been trying to also get ETFs who are also going to buy exposure to these things as well. Don't forget that Grayscale's uh, Bitcoin trust had a gigantic premium compared to the price of Bitcoin. Don't forget the other countries who only literally allow a certain and only have a certain amount of Bitcoin on their crypto exchanges. There are countries around the world, for those of you who have forgotten, who have crypto exchanges that literally based on their country, will only say people in this country can only use these five crypto exchanges. There's only so much Bitcoin to go around. The crypto exchange has to buy that Bitcoin and hold that Bitcoin to be able to offer it to other people. This is why we've seen before in the past during other cycles, there, like, there are premiums on Bitcoin's prices in other countries because people are gobbling up so much Bitcoin because there's not a lot to be had on their actual cryptocurrency exchanges. What ends up happening is, anyway, that's just the idea of people buying, new people getting in, and the actual ETF. That's not the idea of the having. These havings that we're having, <laughs> boom, boom, tsh, isn't isn't like a. These aren't small events. People say the word having, and it it's kind of become synonymous with like uh, Bitcoin getting older. That's usually it. Like people say it as kind of like a matter of factly thing, not understanding that the amount of Bitcoin being created is literally getting cut in half. I told you by the but by the next two halvings, we will have mined nearly all Bitcoin. It will take another 120 years, 110 years to mine the remaining 1% of Bitcoin that's left in the system. What do you think is going to happen to the price? People who are mining Bitcoin as well, th they're new people every single day. We, we usually get the news that this is great for decentralization, which it is. These people aren't mining Bitcoin to be able to throw it back onto the market to give it to you at a discounted rate. They're buying, they're, they're mining Bitcoin for themselves. When they sell Bitcoin because of their energy and, and electricity costs, which is also going to be very different in the next couple of months. If it costs you 20,000 to mine a Bitcoin and the price of a Bitcoin is 30,000, well cool, you made a cool 10 Gs. That's that's absolutely amazing. If your energy cost remains 20,000 and Bitcoin goes up to $300,000, the amount of Bitcoin you're selling off to keep your lights on is a fragment of a fragment of a fragment of what you were selling before. Those fragments go onto a crypto exchange and they're gone because people are buying them up in expectations of other people, of BlackRock, of Fidelity also buying them up as well. There's a whole thing at play here that a lot of people kind of are very blasé about. And people throw this information around and go, well, cool, the halving's coming up. And, you know, I think Bitcoin could get to this amount, but, you know, the, you know, maybe on a really good day it could get there. And it's like, you're not looking at the bigger picture. You're not actually really understanding anything that's actually going on in this market. Once again, to be fair, <clears throat> I would assume the vast majority of you do not have a daily cryptocurrency news channel and or are not absorbing as much crypto news as I am. That's why I try to, in many capacities, to bring you like the actual like really big news of things that's happening that day, that week, that month, so that you really have a, a wider grasp of what's happening. It's nonsense for me to sit here, or otherwise, other people, and to be like, hey, look at this chart. This is red, this is green, this is blue. That's a candle, it's going up, it's going down. Where's Bitcoin's price going? Cool, Bitcoin's price is going to go somewhere. That's just how you know prices and markets work. But you need to understand why it's happening. You need to understand the significance of these people getting into the market at this time, before the having, the accumulation that we've been hearing about has been from these people for the last couple of years. Why are they so adamant 
now to make ETFs, to buy up all the Bitcoin? What are they expecting to happen over the course of the next two halvings that normal people aren't paying attention to? Literally everything I just told you. Everything I just told you is what these people know and what they're looking for. There's a reason why we heard from the head of the NASDAQ and the head of the, the New York Stock Exchange over the last couple of years that Bitcoin is going to be a major world currency. They said that years ago, before the other halvings even took place. Now imagine in the next two or three halvings when there's literally no Bitcoin being made by the, by the system anymore. How high is Bitcoin then? And you, you, you sit back and look and you go, Ah, of course Bitcoin was going to go that high. Of course all this stuff was going to happen. And that's just those catalysts. That's nothing else inside the soup. There's literally nothing else being swirled around. And there's always something different that ends up popping up that we simply don't know about that also has a major movement of it as well. How many other countries are actively thinking about buying Bitcoin? We know that there are over a dozen countries who own Bitcoin right now. And have expressed interest in buying more. What happens if four, four of their neighboring countries go, they made $4.6 billion from a $200 million investment. How do I get into that? How do like, okay, just put $150 million? Cool. What happens when that keeps getting mimicked over and over when there are maybe 400 to 500 to 600,000 Bitcoin that's actually available for 8 billion people on the world? And that's all before we even get into the conversation of rates being cut by the Fed and other countries as well. We usually typically circle in on the Fed as the more dominant news story when it comes to like, uh, you know, monetary policies and stuff like that. But other countries are planning on doing the exact same thing. They, they've been mimicking the Fed in many different ways. They weren't raising interest rates at, at one point. They started to do so. Now they've all nearly frozen their interest rates as well. If the Fed lowers it, they're also going to lower it as well. We've already seen them turning back on the money printer. This, 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 this entire conversation all came from me literally talking about the number 160,000. It is such a very weird number for me to even... Th now, this is personal opinion. This is all personally me. If Bitcoin, with all of this going on, if Bitcoin, with all of this stuff that we have been hearing about, and that I just spoke about, brings us to only a $160,000 Bitcoin, I don't think anything would shock me more in life. That's not, even, that's not even remotely a joke. I'm wholeheartedly expecting, if we don't get to around a $220,000, $250,000 Bitcoin, with all of this over the course of a 24-month period, I would be shocked. As of right now, I'm lightly, lightly, lightly in the corner of Adam Back, the CEO of Blockstream, who said that if we get a Bitcoin ETF approved, he's expecting $100,000 Bitcoin before the halving. That's also where I am. We Do you remember the frenzy that we saw in Bitcoin's price a month ago, a month and a half ago, just off of the information that the ticker symbol for the Bitcoin ETF was listed on a website? Gary Gensler didn't say a word. No one came forward. No company was like, yeah, that's us. You know, we, we got it. It was, it appeared on a website. Remember when the second symbol appeared and the price went up even more? What happens when we get actual confirmation? What if Gary Gensler drags out the actual approvals? Like what if he says on one day, on a Monday, hey, we are approving this one. On Tuesday, he approves another. Wednesday, he approves another. Thursday, another. Friday, another. The weekend is lull. Monday, he approves another. Like what? what where, where does the price go? And that's just from the ETF approvals. That has nothing to do with everything. The, the, the having hasn't then even happened. Anyway, <laughs> this information came from on-chain analysis firm CryptoQuant. And they said this with an interview with Coindesk. They said, we argue that Bitcoin and crypto markets could have a positive year in 2024 mostly amid the effects from one the market valuation cycle, two, 
Network activity, oh gosh, which is also exploding right now. I don't know if you keep up with network activity. It's going off the charts between the NFTs and the actual usage of the Bitcoin network. And something to always keep in mind, if you ever know anyone or have a friend or family member who says that Bitcoin has no value, show them the charts and find the, it, it's, it's, it's online, it's all free. Bitcoin is processing trillions of dollars per month on chain with three transactions per second. That's value. If, 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 if there was a company that appeared, let's say Papalapa company, I'm going to forget that in like four and a half seconds. Company appears, they create something called like a money lane. I don't know. It sounds nice. And for some reason, their money lane isn't going very fast. But this one company is transacting over a trillion dollars per month on their money lane. And their money lane is slow. Three, three kilometers, three miles an hour slow. It's really, really bad. <clears throat> but this one company is doing it. Over a trillion dollars per month. Would you say that that company has no value? Would you say that that company is nonsense and needs to be destroyed? Who, who, who cares that they're doing a, a, tri a trillion per month? That means nothing. Now equate that to Bitcoin. That doesn't go down, has no downtime, is working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. That's just baseline value in trillions of dollars. I, it always annoys me when a lot of these people go on stage and lie and they say that Bitcoin has no value. It's like, you know math. <laughs> you, you know exactly why Bitcoin has value. And that's just Bitcoin's base. That's not including liquid. And that's not including the Lightning Network. There's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff happening. Three, the Bitcoin halving. Four, the macroeconomic perspective. Five, Bitcoin spot ETF approvals. And six, growing stablecoin liquidity. Stable coins are a very like base point for the wider cryptocurrency market. And we've seen that historically, a lot of analysts believe the more stable coins that we have, the more liquidity that we have in the market for people to be able to trade back and forth amongst different currencies. And we've also seen speculation before that the rise in the amount of liquid stable coins for people to be able to use tends to be the precursor of bull markets because rich people are pushing extra liquidity into things like Tether, which then allows other people to have initial immediate access to cryptocurrencies in the case that there is a bull run. I, I, I explain that completely terribly. It's, it's more, just think of like liquidity and like it, access to US dollar value instantaneously, but in the form of something that can be traded immediately against Bitcoin. A bit convoluted, but but yeah, I know I have some charts here. Um, right. Yeah, so there's a lot going on. The, the price predictions are, of course, all over the place right now. A lot of people are predicting where things are going to go. I do question sometimes if a lot of the people who are making price predictions, if they tend to go a bit lower in a way, because they don't want to say Bitcoin's going to 9 million. So they, they, they go back a bit. To kind of give us a number and then if it goes above that, you know, whoop de doo kind of thing. But I think 160 doesn't make any sense. 160 is, I'm, I, I'm expecting over 200. The idea of a half a million to $600,000 Bitcoin that we've also heard of during 2025 is, I'll put it to you this way. If, if we pass by 180, 200 by the end of next year, with all the stuff that will be going on, we'll probably then see a three or four hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin in 2025, like towards the end of the of the run, which also might not even be the end because that's also another conversation that's been going on right now. Um, it says it's somewhere around here. Ba, 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 da, ba. Yeah, they, they, they talk about the, the halving, which is scheduled for April sometimes. We saw a couple of videos ago, there were people who were talking about that they expected the halving to happen sometime in, in May. I don't know where they got those numbers from, but nearly every single website has a different time frame. I don't know how they're counting blocks differently than other people. Uh, but this one says the Thursday, April 18th. I think this one also says something weird as well. Yeah, this one says the 17th of April. They all have different times. They all have different measurements. But of course, as we get closer to it, 
Uh, there will be like an exact time and an exact date. And that alone is going to put people into a frenzy. But as of right now, it is going to be mid-April and probably a lot. Um, like a day or two earlier is what we tend to tend to actually see. Yeah, that's the whatever that was. Whatever the, the rant was that I just went on. Like really trying to understand exactly what's going on and what all of this really means. I, I know it's difficult to really put everything into like one big perspective one big bowl and kind of look at all of it but what we have going on is completely unprecedented we've never gone through something like this before we've had multiple halvings we've seen the effects of the halvings we've seen the effects of hype cycles but we've never had like trillion dollar multiple trillion dollar companies actively like looking at the space and being like i want a piece of it I'm going to own as much of it as humanly possible. Even if we just had MicroStrategy, that should be more than enough for people. The guy from MicroStrategy literally said they're going to be buying Bitcoin forever. They 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 hold between him and the companies like oh, hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin. So anyway, yeah, that's like I said, the crypto quant news, I guess, and where they see Bitcoin going over the course of next year and over the course of the cycle. I, I think we're going a lot higher than that. Yeah. Let's move on. Also in the news, a lot of optimism, always better than pessimism. Grayscale CEO, his name is Michael Zonenschein, believes that a deluge of capital will flow into Bitcoin once the US SEC greenlights a spot market Bitcoin exchange traded fund. In a new CNBC television interview, Zonenshine said that the approval of a spot Bitcoin ETF application will open up the opportunity for a group of investors to get exposure to the top crypto asset by market cap. He said, I do think there's a lot of optimism again in the market. I think a lot of investors are adding Bitcoin to their portfolios. And when we look ahead to the hopeful approval for spot Bitcoin ETFs, it's really it really is going to unlock the opportunity for a part of the investment community that for better or worse, but I would say for worse, has unfortunately been locked out of the opportunity to participate in having Bitcoin exposure in their portfolios. I don't know how this how this conversation continues to actually happen, where a lot of these wealthy people pretend like people just have not had access to Bitcoin over the last 14 years. They could have used crypto exchanges. They just wanted an ETF that's traded on a stock exchange to have access. Like they had a multitude of years to be able to get into the market. It's not any of our faults that they don't have exposure and they've been waiting for this one catalyst in this one moment to actually happen. I don't know if you've seen as well, a lot of the discussion of now adding Bitcoin to portfolios is very, very big. You can find a lot of like, I don't want to say investment websites, but like um, a lot of um, banks, the uh, JP Morgans and the Fidelity and all these other things. They've been sending out stuff to their like investors, basically telling them that they believe that an allocation between like one to three percent into Bitcoin is now something that they should be looking into. And it's like, huh. Because they're not, they're not talking to, to everyday Joes when they say these things. Like They're talking to like their wealthiest clients, telling them to put hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars into Bitcoin at once. That's what I've been saying for years as well. When you hear the news that something happened on Bloomberg or Morning Sun or these other publications or Forbes, when they have articles about Bitcoin, buying Bitcoin, how much Bitcoin to get, there are only certain people, and you know, pinky in the air, who are supposed to be reading Forbes or Bloomberg and these other publications. And it's not supposed to be me and you. And therefore they, so just understand that the, the language and the things that are given to certain people is usually only for certain people. That's why I'm always like, pay attention because a lot of this stuff is being uh, shown to the wealthiest people that we have on the planet. He said, we're really talking about the advised market here in the US which is today about $30 trillion, $30 trillion worth of advised wealth that we hope the approval of Bitcoin ETFs, that are hoping for the approval of a Bitcoin ETF, 
The uplisting of the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust will allow for the opportunity for those investors to partake in that as well. That is, they're trying to get their Grayscale Bitcoin Trust converted into an ETF. And before the discussion of any ETF was happening in the United States, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust was kind of the de facto ETF in the country. And they also had a gigantic Bitcoin premium because everyone was throwing their money at Grayscale uh, for a number of years. So the news here is, and why this became popular, is Michael Zonenschein said on TV that apparently there's about $30 trillion that they believe is waiting on the sidelines. Advised wealth, for those of you who do not know, there are wealth advisors for very wealthy families. You can typically, I mean, a lot of people choose to get wealth advisors when they have around $5 million or more. There are a lot of different metrics for this, but wealth, that is to say like when you are wealthy, is uh, given the number around $5 million. For so, I don't know why, but that's the number within the US. A lot of people have said they would feel wealthy with $5 million. And a lot of wealth managers or wealth advisors uh, tend to only take on clients who have a net worth of over $5 million. That's just the, the thing that actually goes around. Um, and usually they will like, I mean, wealth advisor, they'll advise you on where to put your money, what to do with it. But it's not like a, oh yeah, throw it in the stock market, go buy some apples and, you know, maybe drink some water. They tell you like, we can make your money work for you for the next 100 years. Like that, that kind of, of thing. And when you have like $50 million or a hundred million dollars, they can, and I don't use the word guarantee often, but they can kind of guarantee through their office and through other uh, workings that they can basically make sure that you and your family and their next 18 generations basically will never have to work again. But that, of course, comes with a large swath of money. Yeah, the world's, the world's, uh, the world's getting interesting. And I have said before that I, I think we're on the... I, I, I think we're on the cusp of something like ridiculous that I think a lot of people aren't paying attention to. I know we, of course, I get it. I've, I've seen you screaming at me before. I know a lot of you in here watching this channel right now understand a large portion of what's going on, but it's more so a lot of other people around the world. I think it also says something about it around here. No. Maybe it said it's somewhere else. Uh, for those of you who don't know, one of the main reasons why people are so optimistic about the idea of a um, of a Bitcoin ETF is basically the idea of like what it did to gold and how high gold's price went is a whole nother conversation. But that's also something else to to discuss. Yes. Um. I think that's going to do it for this video. We have a lot coming up. There's a lot going to happen. We now have less than less than three weeks. Uh, the idea for those of you who missed it is that it is expected that the approval of an ETF will happen between the 5th and the 10th of January. Why those dates? Those are the dates that... Um, so like you know how like the SEC is given an application for an ETF? And then they're allotted a certain amount of time to say yay or nay or maybe. They always say maybe. And then after the maybe day, uh, there's like a certain amount of time as well. And people have calculated that based on the filings that have been given to the US SEC, their uh, deadline time frame <clears throat> is between the 5th and 10th of January. So we have less than three weeks. And we within three weeks, we will either have multiple ETFs or we will have none. That's literally like where we are right now. There's a lot happening. Yeah, I think that's definitely going to do it for this video. I do hope that you have all enjoyed. I do hope you all are having a great day, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, wherever you might be. I do hope it is absolutely fantastic. Thank you all once again for watching, listening, liking, commenting, and or supporting. And I will most certainly be talking to you all soon. See you.